uh, Rich, do you want do you want to introduce yourself formally? Sure. I mean, I'm not an especially formal person, so I'll do it a little informally. Uh, I'm Richard, and um, and uh, David and I are partners of crime at Gearhart Law. Uh, we're an intellectual property law firm. We specialize in patents, trademarks, and copyrights, and we do litigation and agreement work too. Um, we really like working with entrepreneurs. That's our our sweet spot. And um, and so we're glad that you're here. Uh, I've been doing the intellectual property thing forever, uh, probably longer than I should be. Um, it's been about 35 years. And uh, so, uh, so there you have it. I mean, we're here today to help you understand intellectual property better. And uh, hopefully you'll walk away with some of your questions answered. So there you yes. have it. Okay, great, thank you. So again, the format, everybody, I'm gonna show you, I'll show you the first myth, as we say, right? This is the first one, fact or fiction, a US patent or US trademark grants you worldwide protection. Is that fact or fiction? You can just chat it in, chat it in the box. I wanna see, I wanna see what you all think. A US patent or a US trademark grants you worldwide protection. What do you got? Oh, here's the answers are question. coming in. You, know, you, you, you don't get anything if you win other than <laughs> the satisfaction that you were right. And remembering what my math teacher told me is knowledge is its own reward. So yes, yes. But there are wrong answers for sure. Um, <laughs> that's okay. I, I'm, we're not gonna pick on anybody, um, but yes, um, it is fiction, right? So for every, to everybody, there, I'm not, and by the way, I didn't try to trick anybody. Um, we hear this a lot. Um, everybody I think needs to understand that uh, intellectual property is territorial, right? Every single country in the world has a patent and trademark and copyright office. If you want protection in one country, you need to file your patent and trademark in that country. And if you only have protection in the United States, then you only have protection in the United States. That doesn't mean you can't do business in another country, right? You, that, that you can still do business, but what it does mean, the harsh reality, is that if you wanted to stop someone in China, right? Everybody, everybody always picks on China, right? If you want to stop someone in China and you do not have the corresponding Chinese patent or Chinese trademark in China, then you won't even be allowed to go into a Chinese court to try to stop that infringer in China. So it is valuable protection to try to take your U.S. patent or U.S. trademark and file it in another country. Um, but uh, yeah, there's no such thing as a worldwide patent. There's no such thing as a global trademark or a global patent. Rich, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe you want to add to that a little bit. I don't think there's much to add. I would, though, uh, point out that if somebody makes, if you have a U.S. patent, and they make it in China and they send it over here to the United States, you can, you can bonk them with your US patent, right? So right. It, even if it's, it, and even if it's uh, you know, partially assembled in another country, there, there are infringement laws that do have a little bit of extra territorial reach as we say in the legal biz. And, but the main thing to remember is that if you want patent protection for a market in a certain country, then you have to have a patent in that country. And yes. one, one strategy that sort of works is that if you have a good intuition as to where the product's going to be manufactured, sometimes it makes better sense to file a patent in that country where it's going to be made rather than focusing on each country where it could be sold, right? If you're on a budget and you don't wanna protect each individual market, then contemplate filing a patent in the country where it's most likely to be made, which is often China. 
which yeah. doesn't have the most robust intellectual property system, but it does give you something to fight with there and negotiate. Yeah. There's some actually there's some good comments on this. And yeah, please, your, your questions on each of these are very much welcome. Yes, Emily, that is why there's so many fakes from other countries because um, it, 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 it because most of the time, whether you're even the largest companies, even the most even these global pharmaceuticals, they're not filing in every country either. So yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of infringement. Um, to William Gary's point about um, a kind of online uh, US trademark uh, enforcement. I think I know what you're getting at here. When, um, when uh, Rich was saying that you basically get the border of the country where you have protection, right? So you, if you only have a United States patent, you have the border of the United States. And if somebody's trying to bring something in, you get to stop them. Well, there are digital borders as well. Right. That's why we have a domain name system. That's why we have we, we, we the, you, you can stop, you know, international infringers, uh, depending on how they're selling their product, um, uh, uh, especially if it's being shipped into the United States. Like Amazon is like very like we, we, we're going to probably hear a lot about Amazon today and maybe and maybe at our next ESS uh, uh, session. But Amazon is like amazing when it comes to this right they 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 have they're really one of the, such a great company that really enforces the intellectual property rights of others and so if you're an amazon seller in the united states and there happens to be a chinese or let's not pick on the chinese there happens to be a seller that's actually selling infringing products on amazon and you have the registered patent on amazon and those products are clearly being shipped into the you know kind of being sold digitally but being shipped into the united states that is a prime case for trying to stop them uh, from, from infringement. So keep that in mind. Uh, and that, that, kind of, that kind of answers Tammy's question as well. So if it's a Chinese company that has operations in the US, that's, that, that's the Amazon scenario. Yes, you can stop them you know, digitally as well as uh, you, you know, physically at the border through customs. Uh, hey, David. Yes, Chris. Just while, just while you're on this topic, I just, yeah. put the, I just put the link in, Invent the Rescue. We have an infringement page with some amazing up-to-date information that's been helping a lot of inventors with infringement. Amazing. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for that. Um, um, who, who put this question? Is that you, Chris, that put this question? Don't you have to sue them in their country if they violate your U.S. patent? Not me. Oh, okay, but what do you think, Rich? Do you don't you have to sue them in their country if they violate your U.S. patent? So let's say it's a Singaporean company that uh, that is selling a that is that 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 is importing a a product into the United States. Do you have to sue them in Singapore, or can you sue them in the United States? It's an excellent uh, question, but. As long as they're selling in the United States, you would have jurisdiction over them in the United States. So, um, and 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 so the answer to your question is no. Um, you, there's a legal test called the minimum contact test, uh, and selling selling products in the United States meets that test. So, the court would grant you jurisdiction uh, to file a lawsuit in the United States naming the foreign company as a party to the US. If you can, it's not always possible, but if you can, you would wanna file a lawsuit against somebody in the United States because the things like discovery and serving and putting people on notice is much more difficult in a foreign country. Um, so, uh, and one thing too is that <clears throat> an infringer is anyone who makes, uses, or sells the device. So even though it be maybe a company in Singapore making it, you may have a, a distributor or a company in the U.S. who are selling it or reselling it or somehow using it, right? And so sometimes that's the kind of leverage that you need. We once had. Uh, a case where uh, a Chinese company had copied a calculator uh, and they were, they were sending the calculator of our client to uh, 
dollar stores in Canada who were then uh, selling them to importing them into the United States and selling them to Walmart. And we could never identify who the, the company was that was making the counterfeits, but we were able to send a cease and desist letter to Walmart saying that we had, this was a case of infringement and they would be named in any lawsuit. And so rather than get tied up in a legal mess, they just backed off and they, they told, the, um, they told the, the company in China, they just stopped buying from them. And then we were able to stop that infringement without filing a lawsuit, right? right? So understanding the distribution network, if it's a foreign, foreign company can help you, right? And as David yeah. said, if they're selling through Amazon, you've got remedies there too. Yeah, that's a great point. And, that, and Chris, to your net follow-up question about Etsy or Shopify, right? I mean, most of those companies, they're not as sophisticated as Amazon. Amazon has the, you know, the, 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 the patent program and they have the brand registry. But a lot of these companies really respect the intellectual property rights of those that are putting up their stores. And so if you look at their terms and conditions, you will see that if you complain to them, that somebody is possibly infringing your intellectual property, they might take some action. Again, they may not, you know, not all companies, you, you're right, Etsy will not do anything without a court decision, 100%. That's, that, that, I, I was actually gonna get to that. Um, but hopefully the more, you know, the, the more of these suits that are brought, the more the online, you know, uh, uh, malls of the world will will kind of, you know, get into gear and start respecting intellectual property. It's bound to happen. Yeah, so you probably have to sue Etsy and you probably have to, right, because they're the, they're the actual seller, distributor, whatever you want to call them, but you also probably have to sue the, the, the actual uh, um, uh, shop that's actually making the product. We'll, 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 let, let's not veer off into infringement yet, but let's go to the next myth. Um, next one. There are no competitors in my business. Therefore, I don't need a patent for my product. What do you think? Fact or fiction? No, no competitors in my business. Therefore, I don't need a patent for my product. <clears throat> what are people saying? Wrong. I love it. Fiction. <laughs> yes, totally. Uh, Fiction, 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 pure fiction, fiction, fiction. Okay, good. Yes, it is fiction. So yes, there are no competitors in my business. Therefore, I don't need a patent for my product. That is false, right? That is fiction, right? Um, the single only way to stop someone from doing what you're doing, from creating what you're creating, is to have the registered form of intellectual property, period, the end of the story. There's no other way. On top of that, there is a concept in, in the world that's called, some of you may know it, it's called first to invent or first to file, right? The whole world is almost on the same kind of scheme, if you will, that if you, if you, cho if, if, if you believe that there were no competitors and that's why you didn't file for a patent, there is a there is a reality that somebody could file for the patent before you or maybe they're after you right so you really have to it's like what we call a race to the patent office and so just because you're not filing and you're choosing not to file because you believe there are no competitors the person behind you is probably filing or the person after you or potentially or potentially before you is probably gonna file first and that can cause you problems where you probably thought you didn't have any. So I don't know, Rich, anything more that we can kind of add to that? I mean, I think everybody kind of knew that, yeah. Yeah, first of all, if you don't have any competitors, congratulations. Right. <laughs> if your idea has any merit, you will soon, right? Um, but the first thing is, as David's right, it's a registration system. So the way the system's supposed to work is that you file for your patent and then somebody else comes up with the same idea and they go to his or her patent attorney and the patent attorney does a search and the search finds your patent, okay? And then the patent attorney tells the person who's looking for a patent, I found this other patent. 
right? And don't, you can't do this because there's already a patent there. You might get sued for infringement and you're not gonna be able to make your product. So you've just saved yourself a competitor and you'll never know it because you don't, everything that that other attorney and that, that prospective competitor, the one who's doing the search, everything that they do is confidential. But we know that that happens because when we do searches at Gearheart Law, we turn down 25% of the, of the projects because, it, it, because it's too close to something else. And we don't think you're gonna get a patent or there's an infringement issue. So without ever going to court, your patent is working for you, right? So that's number one. Number two, if you ever wanna exit the business, you have to have assets. And one thing that investors like is intellectual property. It assures them that they have some sort of monopoly, right? And it adds value to the company if you're going to sell it to somebody. So <laughs> even if the competitors never, they go off in a different direction, um, your, your intellectual property is, is an asset of, of the business. So those are reasons why I think it's really important to consider intellectual property protection. Now, there are some inventions that can remain trade secrets, right? And so if, if an invention remains a trade secret, somebody else can file a patent on it if they do it innocently without stealing your technology, and then you're really screwed. So when I was working at Dow Corning Corporation, we had something called the basic process the basic process was the process that all of the silicone materials uh, used uh, to be created. It was like this huge hot furnace and they put different stuff in it. And out of it came silicone metals that were eventually converted into products. Well, General Electric, our largest competitor, um, filed a patent on our basic process. We would have been infringing even after keeping it a trade secret for 25 years. And it caused a huge problem and management was totally flipped out about this. And it, 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 it took a lot of finagling on the technical side now to change the process so that we weren't infringing it anymore. So that's another good reason for filing patents. So anyway, I'm done. Yeah. No, that's great. I think you, you and I, I was looking at some of the questions and you answered most of them. So that's great. Thank you for that, Rich. Next, we're on the factor fiction. If I file for a patent or trademark, I will not eventually or automatically get it. If I file for a patent or trademark, I will not eventually or automatically get it. Fact, true, 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 true. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, we get this all the time. Right, I kind of, I, I was trying to trick people there a little bit because um, I put put the word not in, but we get this all the time. I, I it, you know, I, I, I it, it sometimes boggles my mind that there are definitely like patents and trademarks as a process. You basically file something with the government, and you basically have to prove through your patent attorney, through your trademark attorney, that your invention is novel in light of everything that has come before it. That's called examination. It's the same thing with a trademark. You have to prove that your trademark is not confusingly similar to another trademark that has been there. You don't just file and you get it. You go through this examination process and we want examination. It's like running the, it's like, it's like, it's like running a race with the fastest people. If you can beat those fast people, then you're really the fastest, right? And so we love examination. All patents are rejected. All trademarks are rejected. We're not scared of that. That's the process. How it's rejected and how we overcome it, that's the point, right? That's what we're dealing with. So as long as we, we, we just, just, everybody should just know, like sometimes you just gotta settle in it's a process. It takes a while. It's the government. And if you're not, if you're not paying to get to the front of the line, then, you know, the process can take a few years to get to, to happen. Yeah, you can do it quicker and there are ways to get it quicker and stuff like that. But in the end, you know, it's almost something you have to, you have to file, kind of forget about it. And then it will, it will, it will make its resurgence when 
when actual examination occurs, but all that time you're protected, you're patent pending, you're trademark pending. You, you, you don't have, you don't have your registration yet. You should be focusing on your business. Right. And so, yeah, for all of you that uh, answered fact, uh, uh, thank you. Rich, anything to add to that? I don't know if there's anything I, I can add to that, um, that wonderful explanation. Um, I, and it's it's you put it in such a positive way, David. It's uh it's 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 really uh, it's it's really awesome. Um, I mean, the only thing I could would kind of say is that sometimes longer is better, uh, <laughs> because you still have the patent pending, uh, so other people are on notice about the patent, right? And it gives you time to let your product evolve, the market evolve. Um, you can file continuations or make changes to the application if your technology changes. Um, and it still has, you know, the patent pending still is, is a pretty strong, is a pretty strong notice, you know. Uh, and if it does turn out that somebody's infringing your patent and you want to go after them, you can always file a petition to make special, which would allow you, which would at least hopefully I uh, put the application towards the beginning of the, the line. And then you would have something to go after uh, competitors with. And the next thing David was going to say was that, you know, sometimes you can tune the claims of a patent to specifically cover what a competitor is, is, is doing, right? And so if your application is still out there at the patent office, you have that flexibility. So you could have one that covers the competitor and one that also covers your product too. Is that what you were gonna say next? Yes, I love that. Yes, perfect, excellent. Okay, we will continue on. You can patent innovations and improvements on existing technologies. Myth or truth? You can patent innovations and improvements on existing technologies. I love it. Well, I love voting, it. you know. I love this audience. We should have like a polling software next time we do one. We will. We were supposed to. We totally will. Do uh, we get do we get discount if we do a good job collectively? Do we get a discount on legal services? Yes, we can totally discuss that, William. We can totally discuss that. Contact me and we can discuss that. <laughs> we'll have to tally up the results though. So, but good, good thinking, very then, entrepreneurial. The next time we might have some harder questions, you know. You know right. Yes, yeah, so it is true. Um, you know, I, 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 some of you may have heard me say this, um, but in order to get a patent, you have to prove a few things. Uh, Tammy just said it, true novelty. What does novelty mean? That's one of the things you have to prove in order to get a patent anywhere in the world. Novelty means three things. It can mean three things. One, aha, I discovered the wheel, right? I'm the first person to discover the wheel. And frankly, today, there's not much of that going on, right? There's not much wheel discovering these days. The second form of novelty is I didn't I didn't uh, uh, discover the wheel, but I took the wheel and I improved it. I made it a super wheel, right? I put chains on it. instead of square. No, yeah, I, 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 I was, well, maybe if it's like Flintstones for sure, but what I was gonna say was like, oh, you put, you, it's like a tire, like a wheel tire, that's what I was kind of getting at. You put chains on the wheel and now you've improved it and you made it a snow tire. That's the second form of novelty. Most of most people are there, right? They're taking existing technologies and they're creating their improvements. And that's what we're trying to get them a patent on. The third form of novelty is finding a new use for something, right? So they took that wheel, they lay it on flat, they put it on a turntable and they turn it into a record player as an example. Right? So something like that, finding a new use for something. So if you are the first to put, you know, things together that have never been seen before, you like, that is your point of novelty. And so we encourage you to, th that's, that, that, that's what innovation is all about. 
You might have some other issues in terms of the second thing that you have to prove in order to get a patent, which is called obviousness, but that's for a whole nother presentation. But yes, th th this was true. Anything to add, Rich, please. I think those were, those were all, you know, really good things. Uh, I, I always say, look at everything. I mean, at this point, everything that's patented is based on something else that's already yes. in existence, right? So, um, and that's, and, 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 and clients will call and they'll ask us about those things and they'll say, well, it's, it's already out there, but I did this. Right. And it's like, but when they did this, it made it a lot better. And you're like, wow, you know, why didn't I think of that, right? Um, and so, you know, so yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you hit it right on the head. Yeah. No, but that's a really good point. I think I, I, we're, we're, I think what we want you all to realize is that don't make that value judgment as to whether you think that something is not patentable or not. You never know. And this, this is also for trademarks and design patents and all that kind of stuff. It, sometimes the smallest difference, as long as there's a difference, sometimes the smallest difference is not only the patentable difference, but it's exactly the difference that allows your company to create the commercial and competitive edge that you need because everything else before it sucked, right? So please, like, don't make those value judgments before speaking to, you know, a patent attorney or trademark attorney or, 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 or something like that, because I think um, you, you might, and again, if you made that value judgment, you can bet that the person behind you who maybe came up with something similar is actually getting a different value, is, is actually getting counseled, let's say, and actually filing for the patent and then, you know, uh, beat you to it type of thing, so. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of like the one-click ordering on Amazon when that got patented. Everybody, this is years ago, but everybody, you know, flipped out, but it, it was a simple change. I don't know if it was a technically simple change, but it was a simple change that, you know, revolutionized the way Apple did business and just the Amazon, 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 I'm Amazon. sorry. And what did I say? Apple. <laughs> oh. Yeah, All they did it if they could. That's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, Amazon revolutionized the way and you still buy books with the one click and the, just the convenience. It, ma it makes it so much easier to buy stuff. So sometimes the smaller, sometimes the smallest improvements are are, are the best, right? Rich, Paul has a great question. I, I've heard this a lot. Maybe you can answer it. Would you potentially need to pay a licensing fee for the underlying object or patent that you improved upon? Pretty loaded question, but, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's something called, uh, so if you're purchasing it, modifying it and reselling it, there's a doctrine called exhaustion of rights. So once you pay for uh, a something that's patented, the license is exhausted and the patent holder has received, you know, their value for it. So then you can take it and you can modify it, okay? Now, if it's a piece of software where it's running in the background, you may need a license to that. If you're incorporating that, that code or that function uh, from another, another company. So, um, you know, both cases are, are possible. Um, and so you may, you may need to get a license, but it depends on what the product is. It just depends on the facts. And so yeah. you it's really need point. to, you need to talk with somebody, uh, you know, and a, a professional about it and, you know, figure out, figure out what's necessary. Yeah. So, but, That's you know, true. if somebody has like a patent on a nut or a bolt, you know, you get one as something from Ikea and they have some weird new bolt or something like that. Uh, and you buy the chair. If you want to resell the chair, you don't have to pay Ikea a license fee uh, the for the bolt. Right. Now, if you have those bolts made, that's a different story. Yes, let's move. That was great. Thank you. Um, let's move on. Still on hold I... with the IRS, by the way. They're, they're, they're not answering yet. Can you hear me? I'm a taxpayer. <laughs> I think somebody I think somebody commented whether you were still on hold, actually. Um, I can get a patent awarded. Letter. 
What? Yeah. Uh, here's the next uh, myth or truth. I can get a patent awarded or granted to me if if there is already an expired patent for the same invention. I can get a patent awarded or granted to me if there's if there is already an expired patent for the same invention. Oh, interesting. We got some uh, myth, fact, myth, fact. Wouldn't that be prior art? Yes, Jacqueline DiCesu. <laughs> <laughs> yes at least you're honest i mean i don't yeah. know well yeah there is some, some mixed reviews here it is a myth right um you the, there there is no there, there, basically when you file for a patent um the patent office is going to do a search which is kind of why rich was talking about why why we do these worldwide patent searches is to see what else is out there and because and it's also to anticipate what the patent office is going to find and so if you thought if, if you thought that by oh i found an expired patent for the 40s i'm going to try to refile it today the patent office is not stupid they're gonna they're gonna find it they're, they're, they're going to find it. They're going to say, you didn't invent anything. It's literally the exact same thing. If you improved it, great, but you didn't. I had a, I had a very uh, um, interesting uh, uh, experience a few years ago. I won't name any names, but an inventor had come to me and said she was in a foreign country. And um, she saw a product uh, out there in that country. Um, the pro I don't remember if the, if the product had a corresponding patent in that country. Uh, that person in that country never filed in the United States. And she came into the office and she said, can I file this in the United States? I want to want to commercialize it in the United States. Let me get a patent on it. Right. And, and so there's a few things wrong with that. One, it already exists, right? There, it's already been invented. She wasn't planning to improve it. It's already been invented, and it, it was it happened to be in another country. But the but but like you know legally and ethically, we already knew that there was a patent on it. So one, we're not going to file it with the patent office, and two, the patent office will probably find that patent in the other country, and they'll say it's already been invented, right? So that's not a good thing. And then the biggest thing is, in order to file for a patent, you have to be the inventor. She's not the inventor. Right, she's the person that saw it in another country and wanted to file for a patent in the United States. That's not an inventor. There might be all sorts of words for that, but it's not an inventor, right? And so, no, it didn't work. We did give her some encouraging advice, which is improve it, right? It's pretty old kind of technology. Let's, you know, let's introduce you to a prototyper, you know, somebody, you know, uh, uh, we can help you kind of think, you know, from a, from a, from, from a mechanical engineering perspective, let's think about a way to improve it, and then we'll file for that patent. She didn't do that, but um, yeah. Anything to add there, Rich? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, there are there are things uh, in the intellectual property rule. There are types of patents that are known as selection inventions, right? And so uh, these are like the most most typically found, I guess, in pharmaceutical, food, chemical patents, where uh, a, a universe of chemicals may be disclosed, right? But you find out that a smaller subset of those chemicals are really good at something else that was unexpected, right? And so even though and, you know, in the pharmaceutical world, they call them compounds. And when we when when we file applications for, uh, you know, uh, for you know for COVID or diabetes or cancer treatments, uh, the there's individual molecules called small molecules that make up the universe of the the compounds that could be used to treat this whatever disease we're trying to treat, right? Uh, and sometimes those compounds may not be so good for uh, diabetes, but it may we may find out later that those compounds are good for treating heart disease, right? right? And so the law says it's okay to take a group of previously disclosed compounds and 
use them for something else and get a patent on it. And of course, you need laboratory data that backs up your claims. But it's a very it's a very common uh, very common type of uh, of approach. So, um, but you know, to the earlier point, the the previous application is still prior art, and you know, in general, if the prior art is right on uh, what you're trying to do, then the only way out is to modify it or go get a license, right? That's always a possibility too. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, um, this, this, is, this is right. So Arlene, this is right on target for what you just asked. My patent search came back positive, meaning no prior art, right? When we say prior art, we mean no prior patents or products have come back. My patent search has come back positive. That means I will get the patent for sure. Myth or truth? People changing their answers. The I saw some people changing their answers. Like, so you James Gershfield, that was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, myth, false, totally. Well, first of all, let's start by saying what we normally, what 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 any I think attorney should probably be telling you. There's no guarantees, right? The, the government is its own animal that we're dealing with, and so 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 keep that in mind. Um, Another thing you have to realize that when we do a patent search and we do it worldwide and we're looking at websites and products and Amazon and we're doing, we're looking at journals and blogs and all sorts of things, because if it's public, if it's published out there, then if we can find it, the patent office can find it, the patent office can find it, they're automatically going to assume that you didn't really invent anything. That being said, there is a period of time that we, we can't see everything. We just can't see everything. There are certain countries that don't publish their, their patents so quickly. Even the United States has a period of time where we can't see things. If you file for a provisional patent, I saw that on the chat, a provisional patent application, the type of application that allows you a year to update it, nobody will see that. That's completely secret until it's converted into a different type of application, which means one from the day that we search, go back at least 18 months, we can't find, we can't, we can't see everything. It's still a good indicator of kind of what's out there. Don't get me wrong. It's, 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 it's an excellent kind of strategic decision to do a patent search and be, just to kind of know what the lay of the land is, to hope to kind of know who your competitors are and to know what you're bringing to the table. But there is always a period of time that we're not going to be able to access. So from that perspective, no, there, there, Nothing is nothing is for sure with the government. For God's sakes, Rich is on hold with the IRS for two hours. He's probably not even going to be probably not even going to get called on today. There's just no guarantee that you can even get someone. So very disappointed with that. That's sad. That's pretty sad. Um, um, well, I, I you know I think it's it's interesting because the 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 search that we do. Um, I mean, we do have at, at Gerhardt Law, we do have proprietary software that we use and that allows one, our attorneys who are doing the searches, their attorneys uh, who are trained in the ways of patent things, um, to who are you so wise in the ways of intellectual property, right? Um, but uh, we're trained in patent things uh, and they, you know, go through, a, look at classifications. Every patent is classified according to an uh, international system, a national system. And we use keywords and we go through and we look at as many patents as we can. Um, and, you know, usually that does a pretty good job. But when the rubber really hits the road and a patent is litigated, the amount of time that, <clears throat> an adversary may spend doing research on a patent goes up, goes from five, six, seven hours to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and, hours. Yeah, and, hours. and, and yeah, and, and in, in my, in my, in my youth, uh, I was living in, in Switzerland, uh, working for a large law firm, Jones Day, and we had an ITC case 
and a, a fleet of associates came over to Europe to do a prior art search. They had eight people there for two weeks going to the patent offices of each country in Europe, looking for prior art. And they eventually did, one of the associates did eventually find a document on the floor in an Italian examiner's office that was novelty destroying. And we won the case based on that. But can you imagine what the expense was to have big firm lawyers going across travel expenses, uh, you know, all of them working eight, 10 hours a day for weeks? looking for prior art, but the stakes of the case were very high. And so it was worth the investment. And, you know, they, they found something that, that, you know, somebody just sitting in their office wouldn't find. Yeah. And so, you know, there, there's, there has to be a balance between being able to give a client who's a startup reasonable advice versus doing a scorched earth search which would, would, which would consume their operating budget for years, right? And so you have, to, you have to balance these things off of each other. And so it's, it's, and it's just, it's not a perfect world. I mean, so, um, so anyway, you know. Those are good points, Rich. Those are good points. And uh, GL, um, I wanna, I, so Savina, I promise we'll get to open source uh, uh, shortly, but GL, do you, you asked, does rejected patents or abandoned ones appear in prior art searches? Yes, 100%, right? We just had that before. If it's expired, that if, 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 if there's something dead on or something similar that was abandoned or rejected or from the 50s or the 20s or, the, or, or 1910 or 1865, we need to know that because the patent office will just say you didn't really invent anything, right? It's already it's already been there. It's, if somebody tried it, it was rejected. Somebody filed it, it was abandoned. Somebody expired. Like yes, we need to know all of that shows up. All that is public information for it to show up. The, the you asked one more question. You asked can one one can use ChatGPT? No, I mean I, I will go on record, you know, and, and say like that that is still not. You know that you 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 might want to use Google or ChatGPT as like your initial kind of searching, but eventually you should have a patent attorney you know do it and kind of give you a formal opinion as to what the next steps might be. Again, don't make those value judgments on your own just because ChatGPT or you know Google patents kind of came up with something. Um, so 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 GL to your to your point, it's it's not just so much about the search, but it's also it's also about the analysis of the search to determine what your next steps would be. Sometimes it's not the end of the story, or sometimes it's the beginning of the journey. And so that I think you need you you need a professional to kind of look at for sure. Yeah, and I think um, yeah. you know the search informs the claims, right? So even if we think it's novel, you still have to, uh, and, and, and non-obvious, you still have to negotiate around what's out there and you have to draft the application, hopefully in a way that it's, it's the, the examiner is going to see that it's different from the prior art. And you, you have claims that are, are, you know, are, are, are clear of it. So understanding what's going out there you know, it, what's out there already is instrumental into drafting a good application going forward. This is why we have the attorneys who actually are going to draft the application do the search, because this way, when they go through the prior art, they understand, they know what's out there, and then they can draft the application in the most effective way possible. Amazing. Yes, Paul Rea, thank you for that comment about ChatGPT. Again, I'm not. I'm, I, I think I think ChatGPT Chat is you know uh, disruptive and has 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 amazing attributes and uses. But in law, we're still a little bit um, we're still a little bit unsure about it and how to use it. Uh, and and you can read Paul's comment there. Um, Yasna, I promise we'll get to your question in a second. Trade secrets. Is that trade secrets is what did I write here? Sorry, trade secrets provides. I don't know where I got that. Is trade secrets provides an easy catch all protection, fact or fiction? 
Trade Secrets provides an easy catch all protection. <clears throat> Yes, no, no, fiction. Yes, 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 correct. Completely fiction, right? I mean, trade secrets is the opposite of a patent, right? Let's be, we'll be very clear there, right? Patents are the most public expression of the thing that you're trying to do. Trade secrets is the most private expression of the thing you want to do. There is no trade secret infringement. That doesn't, those two words don't go, those three words don't go together. There is patent infringement but there is no trade secret infringement. If you chose, and it's a choice you make as a company, if you choose to not go down the patent route and keep whatever competitive edge or innovation or invention you want as a trade secret, and then you discover a competitor might be doing it the same way, you cannot go crying to your lawyer later and say, I think that that competitor is infringing me. I think they're infringing me. Well, no. First of all, well, first of all, you you cannot say infringement because you have a trade secret, right? Second, um, the only the only way you could go after that competitor is if there was evidence of misappropriation, meaning they stole something from you, right? And so, absent evidence of misappropriation, there's nothing you can do. It's why we have the cola wars in our country, right? Coke and Pepsi trying to outdo each other. Nobody has a patent on their form. They're manufacturing process and they're all trying to outdo each other. And nobody can stop anybody from doing anything, right? And so if you want the ability to stop, then yes, you file for the patent. So there's no catch all with, with trade secrets. And it really must be done right. It's not so simple. Everybody's like, oh, I'm not gonna file for the patent. I'm just gonna keep the trade secret. Uh, it's not, it, it's harder than it, than it sounds. Right, everybody, I mean everybody, needs to be locked down with a non-disclosure agreement. There cannot be one break in that chain. The moment there is one break in that chain that can be used against you later, a court can say, "Well, you didn't really keep it a secret. You told you had ten. You told ten people, but you only had nine agreements. Bad." Right. And so for all of you startups out there that are talking to investors or talking to people that were not going to be signing non-disclosure agreements, you probably already blew the chance of keeping something a trade secret. Right. And so your only protection is probably patents. So please keep all that in mind. And for this, you know, the former employees like this goes for everybody. Like uh, this is why having agreements with like your consultants and your freelancers and your employees and everybody you're doing business with in terms of your commercialization and monetization of your ideas, they need to be locked down with non-disclosure agreements. So I think Rich just got his call from the IRS, which is great. So we'll wait for him to come back. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's that myth. Let's do for another one. Why should I file for a patent if someone can just change one thing and I won't be able to do anything about it? I hear this a lot, fact or fiction. Why should I file for a patent if someone can just change one thing and I won't be able to do anything about it? The age old question, yes, Jackie DeJesu, <laughs> totally, right? Why should I file for a patent if somebody's just going to look at it and they're just going to change one thing and I'm not going to be able to do anything about it? Why, why, why should I do that? Fact or fiction, what do you think? Yes, yes, it is totally fiction, right? Um, I, I, this, th that, this statement, bullshit. I always call it on bullshit. Let me explain why. The way that you file for a patent is the like the, the good way to file for a patent or the, the, the best way to file for a patent is to not only file for your invention exactly the way that it exists today, the way you make it, exactly the way you make it, your process, everything. You, you include that 100%, that's what you have to do. But you also include future embodiments, future versions. You change one thing, right? You pretend who your competitors are, how are they going to make a workaround? And you put that in your patent application. Remember, the what you put in your patent application, you will be have you will be deemed to have invented it. 
so that if somebody in the future changes one thing, you would already be able to say, hey, right, I've already thought of that. There's no requirement by the patent offices that you have to make it the way that you described it. No requirement. It helps your case and everything like that, but there's no requirement. You can describe six versions or six improvements of your patent, of your, of your invention. And this way, if somebody changes one thing, you will be able to do something about it because you've already thought about it and you've already put it into your patent application. Yes, GL, you need to cover all of your use cases, all of your intended use cases, right? You're only limited by your creativity at this point, right? Always think out of the box. How can you be your own improver, be your own innovator? And you put that in the patent application as well. It just provides an additional fence and moat around your property. That's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, I should not wait to figure out my intellectual property strategy. Should you be waiting? I should not wait to figure out my intellectual property strategy. Do not wait. Should I not wait? Yes, I should not wait to figure. It's kind of a little not clear, GL, but basically I'm saying, should you wait? I'm saying I kind of tricked it a little bit. Should you not? The, the actual statement was, I can wait, but I, I kind of, double negative and say, I should not wait because it is fact. There is no waiting, right? Ideas are not protectable. If you are sitting on your couch with a great idea and you already see somebody on Shark Tank with a similar product or trademark or, 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 or brand or, or invention, then you've already are too late to the game, right? Because if they're already on TV, they probably already protected themselves. And so you need to race right, is first to file. You have a great idea for a brand, a trademark or logo, file it, right? File it before someone else files it. Do not wait. I see this all the time with brands, right? De definitely with patents, but with brands too. I've, I have clients that like after 20 years of doing business, now they file for their trademark. Well, guess what? Somebody two years prior to you has already filed for their trademark. They were first to file. You might've been first to use, but now if you want the trademark, you have to deal with them. They don't have to deal with you. You have to deal with them because they were first to file. They didn't wait. You waited, right? You snooze, you lose, right? Classic, right? You snooze, you lose. So please like get yourself protected as quickly as you can. And that goes for everything that goes for copyright and creative works that goes for trademarks and brands and logos that goes for inventions. If you, you don't wait, don't like I, 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 the, for artists to wait around, like to paint something and then wait 20 years later to protect that painting through copyright. Wow, that's not a good situation. So much could have, could have happened in those 20 years that somebody could have filed before you on something similar to you and you wouldn't even like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have even known it until it's too late. And so, yeah, uh, just uh, uh, take that all in if you would. Um, hang on one second, a little bit more. Even if I get a registered, well, let's come use the trademark version. If I get a registered trademark, even if I get the registered trademark, an entity can still infringe me. Fact or fiction? Even if I get a registered trademark, an entity can still infringe me. Oh, I like that. I like who someone said depends on the class and all that. Yeah, that's good. Um, but yes, it, it is, it is, uh, it is true on, um, you know, I, I, I think, I think the reason why we put this there, because a lot of, um, uh, just, just to clarify the patent office, the trademark office, the copyright office, when they award you a patent or a trademark, let's take the trademark, when they award you a trademark, they are doing it because they believe that you are not confusingly similar to another one, to, to, to another trademark. They are not looking for infringement. The word infringement is something that a court, an actual court decides, not the trademark office, not the patent office. So is it possible that the trademark office can grant you a trademark because you are not confusingly similar and another 
outside party can still believe that you are infringing them 100%. That's exactly why we have a court system to overturn or confirm the decisions by the Patent and Trademark and Copyright Office. That's kind of how it works. So it's not like, oh my God, I got it. You have the presumption of validity, but you, but you, but, but infringement can still be proven by a third party. Rich, how did it go? Hold the deck for another five to seven minutes. So I thought <laughs> we'd join you. Uh, Rich, we were talking about this. Even if I get a registered trademark, an entity can still infringe me. I was just kind of letting everybody know the difference between, you know, uh, a court, courts and, oh, you got it. Okay, good. You go back. How much is, listen, I, 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 saw, I saw a few things about cost. Listen, I, I'll just say this. Um, I can only give you, I, 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 I can only give you some of the, the, the facts as, as, as I've experienced it. Um, you can definitely get, you know, patents and trademarks for cheap, and you can also get them very expensive. So I think, I think one, I'm not so sure you should be making a decision based on just cost, but based on other factors. And I think you should, you know, talk to a lot of people and kind of see kind of where, where you land. But typically, uh, to get a trademark in the United States um, can maybe, it can take about one to four years, depending on if your mark is already in use in commerce, which is something you have to prove in order to get a trademark, in order to get it registered. It could be about, you know, 1500 to $3,000. Could be more, could be less. Don't hold me. Right, could be more or could be less. A copyright can be a few hundred bucks, maybe six or seven hundred dollars. When all is said and done, if it's done right, and can take about four to six months. A patent can cost anywhere from um, again, it could be a, a higher or lower. It could be anywhere from like twelve to fifteen thousand. Again, higher or lower, and that's for a utility patent, and could probably take about three to four years. Again, it could be much more depending on the technology, if it's life sciences or computer science, but like, you know, just these are costs that you should, I, I see a lot of people kind of uh, throwing in costs. Um, these are costs that, um, that you have to cut that, 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 that may, that, that sometimes seem expensive because you're all pre-revenue, right? When you're not making money, everything's expensive, right? But it's all relative at the end of the day and it's worth its weight in gold. Anything on that, Rich? Yeah, I mean, you have to think, uh, you know, first of all, I always tell clients, potential clients, uh, be as stingy with your IP dollars as you can. Uh, you know, should I get a patent? Should I spend it on marketing? You know, you have to make budgetary decisions when you're, when you're, when you're starting up. Um, you know, the bet on the patent is that you're going to have a successful company. Right. And the fifteen thousand dollars. So if you if you're going into your project and you're expecting to net forty thousand dollars a year in sales, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to spend fifteen thousand dollars on a patent. If you're expecting to net half a million or more on sales, then investing fifteen thousand in a patent for let's say a seven or eight year monopoly. Uh, you get seven or eight years because products change all the time. Sometimes a patent is good for the full 20 years, but just through seven or eight years, if you can protect, you know, uh, uh, a three or four million dollar market with a fifteen thousand dollar investment, then that makes a lot of business sense, right? And that's yeah. why companies file patents because the cost of the patent relative to the value is very high. Now, if you have a competitor who sees your patent and they have to spend six months designing around it, but they eventually do get out there on the market. If you slow them down for six months, you've also gotten a return on your investment, right? Even if it doesn't keep them out entirely, even if it just slows them down. So when you're trying to decide what to invest in, it's, I think intellectual property is a very important consideration, especially if you have you know, even just modest expectations of how your product is going to perform. So yeah, I often I often heard that the pro I, I often hear this and, and and say this a lot that sometimes the sometimes the problems of uh, the, the the problems are more expensive when you don't have intellectual property, right? Think about it from that perspective. 
Um, but yeah, we get it. The stuff, uh, the stuff costs money, right? And so, um, yeah, think about that. Um, okay. Yes, Jacqueline DeJesta, which I think, thank you for joining, by the way. It's been a really long time. So thank you for coming around. Um, you all, but it, it's related to what Teresa Andriotti were, uh, kind of um, talked to. Um, what can I do with my design patents to make a profit? Um, Jackie asked also, can you do a seminar on patent and IP licensing? Um, so one, they're kind of related because the really the way to make one of the ways to make money is to hopefully get the patent and license it to someone. Um, that is a little bit of a holy grail situation in today's world, I think. And I say that because you always have to be able to take the next step in order to make yourself more attractive to licensors or, or to, sorry, to licensees, yeah. right? So always think about that. Just having, just having the patent might not be enough. So always think about taking the next step. And then to Jacqueline's um, question, Jacqueline, we actually had a seminar about six or seven months ago um, about licensing strategies and stuff like that. It's on YouTube, but um, it is a popular topic. And I do think we, we, we probably have to kind of do it again. Um, I think the, the actually the, the, the first time we did it, Jackie, we had licensing professionals, like people that, you know, uh, talk about how to monetize your intellectual property, like, and, and there's all sorts of ways and it's hard, it's not so easy. But I think maybe the next time we do this, Rich, maybe we have some of our clients who have been successful in licensing. We have a lot of those. Um, but again, you'll hear from those people that they're, they usually have businesses that are built around their patents that they then license. That's the, that's the difference. Wouldn't you say, Rich? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, you know, that's a, that's a great idea. Uh, and, you know, certainly monetizing your patent through licensing is a, is a key strategy. So um, I I would be fine if if we if we could do more programs on that. I think that would yeah. be um, you know a great interest. How, how many how many how many of ESSs have we done now? It's been about two years straight almost. So we've done twenty four. So I, like do you 22. think anybody will like ding us on our evaluations if we repeat some topics? No, I don't think so. We just, we have to put, put a fresh take on them. That's all, you know? <laughs> um, there was some question here. Does the cost of a utility patent, from Robert, does the cost of a utility patent also depend on how much work the inventor puts in themselves? For example, can they lower the cost by drafting some of the literature, doing some paperwork? My, my, what might be the range? Yes, you know, Robert, a lot of our clients um, are let's say technologists or computer scientists or or physicians or you know uh, chemists or mechanical engineers themselves, but they and so they they really provide a lot of you know support to us. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to have our stamp of approval on it, and we're going to do most of the writing. But yes, Robert, there is a way to kind of decrease and or or kind of like um, offset some of those costs that would that 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 would go into the application. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, that's a strategy as well. Um, okay. Ah, even if I own the domain name, I still need to file, I still need to file and register the trademark too. Even if I own the domain name, I still need to file and register the trademark too. Myth or truth? Oh, yes, please. Yes, totally. You'd be surprised how many times a client has come in. That, so that's true. Of course you do, right? A domain name is not a trademark. But how many times I've heard the statement, I own the domain name, of course I'm going to get the trademark, or I already own the domain name, which is a sure bet that I'm going to get the trademark. No, it's completely, I mean, they're related in many ways, right? The domain name the domain name system was created to support trademark uses online. That's what it was all about. Brands to be protected, their brand should be protected through their domain names, but they are separate procedures, right? Domain names are evidence of trademark usage, right? Not just the domain name itself. People say, oh, I'm, I'm, because in trademarks, you have to prove that you're using it in order to prove that you're using it in commerce in order to get your registration. 
So I definitely have, uh, definitely have heard in the past where people say, well, I have a domain name, I'm using it. No, if you go to your domain name, it's parked. So that's not helping it. If your domain name actually had, you know, your trademark on it, if the, if the goods and the services you file for a trademark were available on that domain name, on that website, then of course you can use the domain name um, as, as evidence of your trademark usage. But they're entirely two different things. And it sucks because it's easy to buy a domain name. It's like three bucks, right? Okay, I've got the domain name. I'm definitely going to get the trademark. A trademark is not three bucks, right? It's a process and you need to, and you need to, and you need to get it and, and you need to try to, you need to go through an examination and it has to be awarded to you. And so it sucks that if you don't get the trademark and you have the domain name, not much you can do there. So usually we say, like, people are like, what should I do first? Now you should probably do them at the same time. But know that you know if if you don't get the trademark, if you don't get the corresponding trademark to your domain name, then yeah, you're probably out three bucks, right? So, which is not such a bad thing. Yes, you can sell the domain name, correct? But yeah, Rich, what do you think? <laughs> domain name, uh, a trademark versus a, a domain name. Yeah, uh, yeah, you kind of have to do both at the same time. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad idea to get you know, brainstorm and get all the domain names that you can because they're relatively Point. inexpensive. And then you then you then check and, you know, do trademark searches, uh, uh, you know, on the ones that, you know, you like, like the best and then, you know, hopefully file a trademark application, you know, fairly quickly. And when the when 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 the time is right, um, you know, it does, you know, it, it having a domain name is extremely important. You know? totally. um, and so, uh, you know, having that, that, that critical domain name uh, is, is important. And if I can just say here, if you want to learn more about patents, go to learnmoreaboutpatents.com. <laughs> awesome. Or, or learn more about trademarks.com. Uh, Arlene has a good question. Someone has a similar name to my handmade jewelry name online. Should I change it? Um, so Arlene, in order to get a trademark in the world, you have to have one, you have to be the first to file that name. And as we talked about before, um, you, it, has to be dis it, it has to be distinctive. It has to be something that, that uh, the trademark office hasn't seen before. Um, and that is not confusingly similar to another trademark. So the fact that you already know that there's already somebody online that has a similar name to you may not be the end of the story, but it's something we have to think about because they have what's called common law rights, unregistered trademark rights. So in this hypothetical, if that that, that similar name uh, company does not have a trademark on file, they, they have what's called a common law rights, unregistered trademark rights. And so, yeah, that might be a source, a, a, a pain in, 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 in your side, right? For sure, because it exists prior to you. So you might, you, so I, I guess there's, there's not really a, a, we'd have to really look at the facts and see if that, if that similar name has already filed for a trademark and to see what other social media handles they might have that might actually cause a pain in your thigh, side when you're actually going to try to sell your product. But I think it's, I, I think it's worth a conversation for sure. Um, so the answer could be yes or no. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, there's not more of a clear answer, but um, yeah, we should, it's something to probably um, keep talking about. I think we're going to do just one more in the interest of time. There's a lot more to cover, but in the interest of time, let's do this one. Trademarks only protect words and logos, myth or truth. Trademarks only protect words and logos. What do you think? Truth, Karen Hump. Jerry, true, true, true. I see some myth, myth, no. Um, yeah, this is interesting. This is uh, a myth, right? A trademark protects anything that is a source identifier and appeals to the five senses of a consumer, right? A smell could be trademarked. A sound could be trademarked. A shape could be, like touch, a shape, like the Red Bull bottle 
Okay, right? They they like if you look at if you look at a if you look at a Red Bull bottle, not only do they have the Red Bull, the words, they have the logo of the two bulls, they have their gray and, and navy pattern, right? Their triangular pattern, but they also have a protection on the actual configuration. Think about Lego. Every Lego piece has Lego carved into its little head. That's what we call trade dress. And so Lego has protection over their figurines, how their figurines look. And so again, if your shape or sound or smell is distinctive, right? And is not confusingly similar with another one, then you can get protection. The MGM Lion, yes. Um, Mary, 3D marks as well, right? That's very cool these days. We have clients that like, like you know, like every time you open an email, you'll see at the bottom of someone's uh, thing, they'll be like some sort of animation, right? Animations are, are, are protectable. Yes, three-dimensional marks are protectable. All of that is protectable. And really where you should be thinking outside of the box, right? That's where you can get really innovative. If you're not in the, from the world of patents, it's not all about patents, right? If you're not from the world of patents and you're all about branding, packaging, customer experience, there are so many out-of-the-box ways that you can accomplish trademark protection on, uh, on your on your brand and your product and service. And so um, again, all of that would have to be searched and, all, and it's kind of the same process. Um, but uh, think about that uh, when you're kind of uh, going through your, uh, kind of going through your intellectual property strategy as it, as it applies to your trademark. Um, it is, here? yeah, please, please, go for it, go for it. Um, so we actually um, came across a company that filed a trademark on the shape of a piece of lettuce. Love it. <laughs> so this is a very curly lettuce. I think the company is called um, Little Leaf Farms and they have this baby curly lettuce that is very small pieces of lettuce and it curls around. And they so they filed a trademark on uh, that shape of lettuce with the trademark office, it's in the process of being examined, um, but we don't know yet whether or not the, the trademark office is going to, to grant this. Um, and it sounds ridiculous, but they have comments from their clients that say they're able to recognize uh, the brand of lettuce based on the shape. And, and so they're, they decided to trademark it. And if you can come up with something like this, it helps with publicity. Even if you don't get the trademark, uh, it's a fairly inexpensive way to get some attention for your product too. Right. So <clears throat> um, I just thought I'd put that out there because it was so unusual. And you could hear about it on Passage to Profit. So we actually talked about this on uh, the firm's radio show. And <clears throat> you should tune in and, and, and take a listen uh, when you can. So anyway. Okay. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the invitation. So. Yeah, so just a little shameless plug there. Shameless plug for sure. Uh, William, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was gonna. I, I I didn't want you to go over my um pumpkin spice. So pumpkin spice can be um because you said a scent can be trademarked. So can Starbucks trademark pumpkin spice latte if it had a unique smell and taste? Te technically, yes. If 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 it had if it had a distinctive uh, a smell that was that that was not already known, right? You have to look at it like that, right? Because again, if 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 it if it previously exists prior to what you filed, then the trademark office can just say, well, it's just generic, or you didn't really you you, you didn't you didn't really create anything distinctive there. But technically, um, if they were able to prove that pumpkin spice was uh, was something that they you know kind of created that smell, then yeah, they can possibly get a trademark on that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's very interesting. Like for those of you that might have consumer that might have, uh, you know, retail store locations, like Apple has a trademark on how their stores look, right? There's a reason why all of those stores look the same or why all Starbucks look the same. They have trade dress or trademark protection. So um, definitely think out of the box when it comes to, to kind of uh, protecting your brands. 
Um, how does one make money from trademarks? Do you need to have a business attached to it? Or can you sell a trademark to another business? GL, listen, it's a really good question, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing with it's the same thing with licensing patents, right? Licensing or selling patents. The patent and the trademark will only be at its maximum value if you created a business case for that patent and trademark. Right? I, we actually had a client a few years ago that was creating terms. He wasn't getting them, he wasn't using them, which means he wasn't getting them registered, but then he would try to sell them to companies like Amazon, like, oh, they're going to need that for their marketing. Uh, you really think, like, you really think Amazon's going to just, you know, buy that trademark off of you for like $30,000 simply because you have it and you're not using it yet? If you used it, if you created a business case for it, if you increased its value, then yeah, maybe they would try to, maybe they maybe you'd get their attention and maybe they would try to buy it from you. But those are the, but, but GL, that, 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 that stuff don't happen really. So um, there, that's the biggest myth I think of intellectual property of the, of the, of the industry, which is I can just get the patent or trademark and they're going to come running. They're going to come, they're going to come license. They're going to come, they're going to need a license from me or the, they're going to not be able to turn down my patent or trademark. No, that really doesn't happen these days anymore. You need to create a business around it. Um, just some final questions. I have a registered trademark and I recently saw another company using it. What do I do? Jerry Lynn, uh, that is a classic. You need to you know, send them a cease and desist letter. You need to uh, probably have an attorney uh, un, un, kind of give you advice as to how strong your trademark is in relation to how they're using it and if they are actually infringing you, right? Because again, just because you got a trademark registered doesn't mean that they're, that, 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 that third party is automatically infringing you. There are pros and there, there, there are things that have to be weighed. So um, you should have somebody look at it. Let us know if you want to look at it. Uh, can you, yeah, we talked about licensing or trademarks. Uh, yeah, you can assign your trademark correct. Uh, just some final questions. Hey, David. Yeah. Yes. Chris, I got a question. Uh, a good, a good myth that I get, I get a lot of inventors reaching out to me uh, and telling me that they've heard they can let their provisional expire and then extend it for another 12 months. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. Um, so, so, um, so for everybody, uh, we talked about it a little bit before, a provisional patent application is the type of application that allows you to update the application within a year. Um, if you choose not to convert your provisional into a non-provisional application and you let your provisional expire or go abandoned, then technically you don't have any protection anymore. But what's become a very popular strategy for some, and it comes with, to, to Chris's uh, point, but it comes with some detrimental features, is that at the end of that year, right? So, 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 so let's say you file a provisional uh, today on uh, June 27, 2023. On June 27, 2024, you let it go expired. And instead you refile it, right? Because you only have a year to kind of make that decision. So you refile it. You can totally do that. Right, you can on June 27, 2024, you can refile your provisional. However, you literally just lost a year of protection. If if you if, 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 right, you start on June 27, 2023. If you would have converted it, your protection would have started, and your invention date would have been from June 27, 2023. By letting it expire and then refiling it on June 27, 2024, or any time thereafter, your invention date and your protection now begins from June 27, 2024. So you just lost a year. So if somebody happened to have filed on June 28th, 2023, one day after you, they're now before you in this hypothetical, right? Because it's whoever has the earliest filing date. So it's a very big decision to let a provisional go expired and then have to refile it. You, it means that you have, will have lost some protection for sure. And that could be everything in, in the journey. Okay. Kevin, what's up, Kevin? Or oh, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yes, can, you, um, can you talk about open source 
situations yes. when it comes to IP? Right, I saw a few questions on that. I'm sorry we didn't get to that. Um, open source is the opposite of patents, straight up, right? Just like trade secrets are the opposite of patents, so is open source. Open source means it's for everybody. Everybody has it. Nobody could monetize it. Nobody could enforce it. Nobody could try to protect it. So for those, we definitely have a lot of clients in software that use open source technologies as part of their software solution. However, what we are patenting is not the open source part of their software solution, because that's the whole point of the open source license. No patent protection. Nobody gets it, right? Everybody has a free license to it, or sometimes a little paid license to it. But you can use, if you use open source and you add additional programming and software and development to your software solution, that's the part. Call it, call it an improvement if you want. That's the part that we're trying to get you a patent on, not the open source part. And so you need to think about that. Investors, they the ones that want patents, they're probably, if you're coming to them with an open source solution, yeah, you might have millions of you, you, you might have millions of users and whatever, but you're not going to be able to stop someone else from doing something similar and using the same open source that you just used. There's no way that that's not, that, that's exactly what, that's exactly the point of it. And so it may not help you in the long run in terms of getting investment, which are some of the other reasons why people go down the patent route. William, did you have a question on that? Yeah, so um, I haven't kept up with the open source community, but I do know that it has evolved to where there's like a bunch of different open source licenses now. License. And then, and then um, like Red Hat, when they started, they couldn't, they couldn't, I guess, monetize or protect the software, the underlying technology. So what they did was kind of like offering paid or business services. So my question is, if you're using, if the foundation of, of your innovation is open source, a lot, a lot of those licenses is about whatever changes you make, you give it back to the community. So right. are you saying there, there's, so, so is it dependent up upon the open source license and which the innovation is built up upon, essentially? It could be, William, 100%. Even, e even, even the licenses that have emerged from open source license still prevent you from going after someone that's infringing you or, or, or actually trying to monetize it through getting a patent. So you have to read that license very carefully. We are, we are not in a situation yet where open source and patents play in the same. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Oh, I, um, I want to talk about this. Uh, Antonetta, what about content created using AI like ChatGPT? It's a really good question. You know, um, the Supreme Court has recently kind of ruled on this type of thing where they said that an inventor has to be a human being. It cannot be artificial intelligence, right? A copyright, I think the Copyright Office has also said this, that if you want to protect something, that if you want to protect an original creation, a human has to have done it, right? So like, so like again, you know, going onto ChatGPT and saying, create me a logo, no, we're not there, that we're not there yet, right? Um, believe me, I, I I would love a world where artificial intelligence has rights. I'm a yeah. big, uh, I'm a big dystopian, you know, kind of future world, uh, uh, um, uh, kind of um, uh, addict, basically. But we're not there yet, right? We need we 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 need human creation and human involvement, and not just speaking it into ChatGPT in order to create something original, inventive that you can get uh, that you can get a patent or copyright on. Okay. Um, I think we're at time. It's been a while. Um, we, we, we definitely had time. There are there were so many more myths. I promise we'll do a part two to this. Um, our August, our August entrepreneurial strategy series, because we're taking July off for the summer, our August one is going to be amazing. Um, it's all about uh, cease and desist and all about infringement. We have two clients that are coming on. They're amazing. Um, one, one has, you know, used the Amazon um, kind of uh, registry 
and 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 kind of you know enforced her patent there and it's it's an amazing story to hear and then another one has used it only has trademarks no patents and has used cease and desist and like different procedures and 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 different methods to try to protect his brand and so you'll hear from them directly and i think you'll you'll hear from them you know honestly and truthfully the cost the problems the issues the money all of it and so that will be the last Thursday of August, which will be the 31st. And we'll send out, by the way, we, we will send out this recording. We will send out a little recap. And uh, we thank you all for, for coming. And um, again, if, there, if, if something hasn't been answered, I'm sorry, just maybe email me or Rich directly and we're happy to, to kind of hop on a Zoom with you and answer something specifically. It doesn't cost anything. And so please take us up on that. Thank you, Chris Landano and the Inventors Association of Manhattan. And uh, check out Inventor Rescue. Check out all of the sites I think that you saw uh, on this um, uh, uh, on the chat. There's some amazing companies that have been represented and you should check them out and try to try to kind of help each other out. Hey, so, David, uh, yes. just one, one quick announcement. Uh, Super Zoo is a big pet show coming up in August. The United Inventors Association, we've got a stage there. I'll be out there. So if you guys have any of your clients working on pet products, we, we, we've, uh, we've partnered with the show. We've got a, a pretty good lineup out there in Las Vegas. And uh, as, we, as we move forward, the United Inventors Association is partnering with a lot of different trade show organizations, like you know, the PGA show, the tools and houseware show, if any of your clients or anyone on the call is going to be looking to go to any of those trade shows, I'm at all the shows and we got a lot of things coming up. But again, today, great job with today's presentation. Uh, today's uh, presentation, David. This was cool getting everyone involved. Great job. Awesome. Rich any, final, Rich, any final thoughts? No, you guys have said it all. I just uh, thanks to everyone for coming. And uh, I think we've enjoyed doing the presentation. As as much as anything. And it's really uh, amazing to see all of the reactions and all of the questions come through the chat. It's, uh, it's really heartening for an old intellectual property guy like myself to see so much interest. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Thanks, everyone. Have a good 4th of July weekend. Be safe. We'll see you in a month or so. And uh, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.